This is the Monday, May 1st, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. President Ike for President Ike for President Ike for President You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike for President Ike. We don't want John or, or Harry. Let's do that big job right. Let's get in step with the guy that's up. Get in step with I. You like I, I like I. Everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner and beat the drum. We'll take I to Washington. We got to get where we are going. Travel day and night for president. Let Adelaide go the other way. We'll all go with I. You like I, I like I. Everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine touches down at the height of the Red Scare. Our destination is the Oval Office of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, whose public stance of ignoring Senator Joseph McCarthy's descent into demagoguery, refusing even to mention his name, has long been cited by historians as evidence that the old general just didn't care. Some have even dared call the former Supreme Allied Commander a coward for not speaking out. In fact, Ike was doing a lot. His strategy would later be dubbed the Hidden Hand. See, he felt that to attack McCarthy straight on would raise his stature within the Republican Party and the nation, and ultimately be counterproductive. The book that sets the record straight is Ike and McCarthy, Dwight Eisenhower's secret campaign against Joseph McCarthy. The author of this book is David A. Nichols, a leading expert on the Eisenhower presidency. He holds a PhD in history from the College of William and Mary and lives in Winfield, Kansas, a couple hours south of Ike's hometown of Abilene, which I have to tell you is just a fantastic city to visit if you like presidential history or history of the Second World War. Previous books by David A. Nichols include A Matter of Justice, Eisenhower in the Beginning of the Civil Rights Revolution, and Eisenhower 1956, The President's Year of Crisis. You can follow our guest on Twitter at the handle David A. Nichols and the digit 8 to keep up to date on this latest book and his view of current events through the lens of history. Okay, now that we've read our Senate briefs, let's pick up David A. Nichols and meet Ike and McCarthy. Now is the time for all good Americans to come to the aid of their country. I'm joined on the line by David A. Nichols, author of Ike and McCarthy, Dwight Eisenhower's secret campaign against Joseph McCarthy. Thank you for making time to chat with the History Author Show. I'm honored to be with you, Dean. Well, the honor is mine and really the thrill because Eisenhower is somebody that I don't think he gets his due or hasn't gotten it. And you tweeted something out there from your David A. Nichols and the Digit 8 Twitter handle on March 18th of 2017. Eisenhower was just rated number five among presidents behind Lincoln, Washington, and the Roosevelts. This is really a turnaround. He's really more than a guy who just played golf. We see a lot of pictures of him out there playing golf, and that was kind of a knock against Eisenhower for a long time. And now Ike and McCarthy explodes another one of these myths about him. You outline how Eisenhower kept his fight against the Wisconsin senator of his own party, 
hidden from public view, but also there was this factor that is similar to Ulysses S. Grant, another great general turned president, whose enemies wrote the history, whose enemies were better writers than his friends. A lot of those Southern generals had time to kind of sit around and pick him apart and blame him for everything that went wrong. I wonder how those factors combined to hide the true story of Ike's role here in McCarthy's ultimate downfall. Well, the two big knocks on Eisenhower when he was rated low was his lack of really rhetoric. It's the bully pulpit that's the issue. Lack of rhetoric on both civil rights and McCarthy. And civil rights is not what we're talking about today, but that's another big subject on him. But there are three main reasons why Eisenhower was neglected for so long. First, it was his own penchant for secrecy. He just was awfully secretive. But more important, the the main three reasons in my profession was that there's bias in my profession. Historians, liberal East Coast historians, for decades, never quite forgave Ike for defeating Adlai Stevenson in 1952. And those Ivy League historians passed on their bias to their students. And so many of the top historians for decades took for granted that Eisenhower was just not an effective president, even though, even when they gave him credit for great leadership during World War II. The second thing is that Ike decided to uh, establish his library in Abilene, Kansas. Eisenhower never forgot where he came from. That's where he grew up. And having it in that little town out in Kansas made those records less accessible. And for somebody wanting a glamorous place to go do research, Abilene's a very small town. It's a nice town, but there's not even a movie (laughs) in town. And finally, numerous documents have been declassified in recent decades. And the most important collection is the documents that Fred Seaton, Fred Seaton eventually became the Secretary of the Interior. He was very close to Eisenhower. Fred Seaton collected these documents on Ike's orders during the Army McCarthy hearings in 1954. And he collected thousands of McCarthy documents on Eisenhower's orders to keep them from falling in the hands of, the, of their enemies. And he took those documents, locked them up, took them with him when he went to from the Pentagon to become the Interior Secretary. He was Assistant Secretary of Defense when, when he did that for Eisenhower. And later he took them home to Nebraska, believe it or not, with him when he left government. You know, Fred Seaton was a close ally of Eisenhower. He grew up in Manhattan, just down the road from Abilene. And the Seaton family was a newspaper family, was very close to the Eisenhowers all the way through. But Seaton collected all these documents, and they did not become available to scholars at the Eisenhower Library until after Seaton's death in 1974. A lot of them were still classified after they were sent there, so it took some time. So that's the most important thing. I've been through, oh, estimated 10,000 pages of those documents. Dean, I'm not a pundit and I'm not a journalist, although I have great respect for both those professions. If it's not in the documents, it's just not in my book, or at least there is, if there isn't compelling circumstantial evidence that leads us to the conclusion. That was a tough part of this, too, because you have somebody with a penchant for secrecy and keeping his role hidden. That must have been a real challenge for you here to try to get the footprints in the sand, so to speak, of Eisenhower and find out what he was doing to build your case here. Well, his secrecy is sometimes almost hard to understand. He didn't really reveal, even in his own memoirs, what he did with McCarthy. But I'm satisfied it's quite well documented. One of the great sources is the diary that his press secretary, Jim Haggerty, kept. Then there's a lot of other documents that we have now, and above all, that Seton collection is just paramount for what really happened. Because Fred Seton was Ike's guy in the Pentagon who put together the report on the privileges sought for G. David Shine by Roy Cohn and McCarthy. Roy Cohn and Dave Shine were really boyfriends, Nobody ever talks about that, but the 50s was a terribly homophobic period. But Seton put together the report that caused a firestorm of controversy in early March 1954 that led to the Army McCarthy hearings. And those Army McCarthy hearings continued for two solid months on television on the three networks that were available in those days. And those hearings effectively destroyed Joe McCarthy. I think a lot of people want 
Eisenhower to confront McCarthy at the time they wanted him to. And today, still, they want to have, as you said, the rhetoric there. They want to have kind of a showdown out of seven days in May. That's what I always picture, that people wanted this really dramatic scene where he just rips him a new one and McCarthy slinks away under a rock. But set the stage for us. Here's Eisenhower coming into office. He's not only a president who's never held any elective office, but he leads a Republican party at this point that's been out of the White House for a generation. You think of all those positions to fill, everybody, that you have in a White House today more than them, but still, he had a lot of people he had to go and find, and he had to learn his way through this, despite having run the war. This is much different to be a president, one of a co-equal branch of government. So, so what challenges does that present for Eisenhower as Senator McCarthy starts launching not just his investigations, but also has his eye on the presidency? Yeah, well, as Milton Eisenhower said, Eisenhower loathed Joe McCarthy, but he understood immediately that he couldn't deal with that issue right up front. You're exactly right. The Republican Party had been out of power for a generation, and Ike's on record as saying he thought one of the first things they had to do was learn to govern again. And he was pretty naive himself in terms of party politics and made some mistakes initially. He was a quick learner, but he had lots of things on his plate that first year. Because the Republicans had won a one-seat majority in the Senate, McCarthy became chair of the Government Operations Committee and its permanent investigative subcommittee. And he used that subcommittee to issue subpoenas right and left, hold one-senator hearings, accuse people of guilt by association. He often picked on the little people. We can come back to that. But they had been out of power for a long time. McCarthy had a lot of prestige, and Eisenhower had other big issues to deal with. The American people were still recovering from the effects of the Great Depression and World War II, and now the Cold War. And Ike's priority, above all, was to end the Korean War, which was still going when he came into office. He did get an armistice for that in July of 1953. And the Soviet premier, Joseph Stalin, died in March. And the new Soviet leadership was unknown and uncertain. Ike did go after McCarthy in certain issues. After the death of Stalin, he nominated Charles Bolin as the new ambassador to the Soviet Union, and McCarthy vociferously opposed that nomination, but Ike beat him on March 27th by a vote of 74 to 13. So that was a major victory over McCarthy, but he really wasn't taking on McCarthy friendly at that point because of all these other priorities. You say big issues, and I think it's important to point out that communism was clearly a threat in the 1950s, and Eisenhower knows that. Yet, Ike says, quote, freedom cannot be served by the devices of the tyrant. It's not an act with him. He is that boy from Abilene. He says, that's the proudest boast that I can make, right? It's, in fact, on a statue of him as a boy in Abilene, Kansas. And I love that town. I would love to be able to go there. And as a researcher to write a book, I could see it not being sexy for someone who's from the East Coast and used to a big Harvard library, maybe. But with that in mind, he has this idea McCarthyism is a symptom, not a cause, and he needs a strategy to fight both the red menace, as it was known, but he doesn't want to use what McCarthy's is. So how does he do that? How does he straddle that and confront the real threat without sliding into McCarthy's really far out there ways? Well, I think one thing we have to say, in fairness to McCarthy, even, that there were indeed spies in the government. Now, that's been well documented. There's no evidence that Joe McCarthy ever caught one, but there were spies. And Eisenhower permitted the Rosenbergs, who were convicted spies, to be executed on his watch. They'd been convicted before he came to office, but he could have commuted that sentence and did not. He sent his attorney general, Herbert Brownell, to make a speech accusing the Truman administration of malfeasance in their handling of Harry Dexter White, a Treasury official who had been deeply involved with setting up the financial system after World War II, and who had apparently passed secrets to the Soviets. So Eisenhower administration, while they rejected McCarthy's wild charges, made it tough on potential spies and security risks. They uh, supported withdrawing the security clearance for Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atom bomb, which is a still pretty controversial thing. Eisenhower declared that government service was a privilege, not a right. And someone could be labeled a security risk if they were one of four things, if they were alcoholics, philanderers, blabbermouths, 
and especially homosexuals who were perceived as vulnerable to blackmail by communist agents. And let me just say again about that issue with modern people, it's tricky to talk about because we've become much more enlightened about our view of gay people. In this period, we're talking about just the rumor that someone was gay, not the fact could cost them their job. That's something I was going to bring up about the rumor of it. Then it kind of creates a climate, again, with Eisenhower sort of finding the middle way. You could blackmail somebody simply by alleging it. Think about it. If, if you're a Soviet agent and you want to get somebody, it's not too tough. If you're using a still camera, you could have just a stranger come up and hug them and use them. So, well, they, And that, that happened. Yeah. That happened quite a bit. In fact, one of the charges that McCarthy's forces made against Charles uh, Bolin Ike's nominee for ambassador to the Soviet Union was that he was gay. was not true, though he had a brother-in-law who probably was. It was a way you could you hurt somebody very easily just by doing the rumor mill. It's interesting to think of it in the same light as the charge of communism itself. We have a lot of those things, and I think people are too quick to throw them out. I guess everybody thinks that when they stop to think about it, or hopefully they do. But I found that a fascinating undercurrent in Ike and McCarthy, where you talk about how these methods, as Eisenhower calls them there, the methods of the tyrant, the devices of the tyrant, those are not the tools that you want to use. If you want to get rid of somebody, you know, do that shoe leather work. And another person that plays a role here is Richard Nixon. You don't think of him as being key in the Eisenhower administration, partly because, you know, Ike makes that off the cuff quip and says he can't think of anything when he's pressed on it when uh, Nixon's running for the presidency. But he says many times, have Dick do this because he has unimpeachable anti-communist credentials. And he's a soldier or a, I guess a sergeant, maybe a captain, a major here in Ike's fight, isn't he, Nixon? Yeah, I, I could never live down that one remark at a news conference where he said it might take him a week or so to think of something. I, it's just one of those I'm sure he regretted. Uh, actually, Nixon was a quite a, an effective vice president. He was a very important counselor on politics including Joe McCarthy to Eisenhower, especially after Robert Taft died in 1953. And Nixon became the primary political advisor to Eisenhower in many regards. He wasn't one of the key subordinates carrying out the operation against McCarthy, but he was an advisor on it and an effective vice president. And Richard Nixon's gotten tarred in so many ways by the way he left his presidency. It's always remarkable for history how one episode will paint somebody, and we, we kind of ignore the rest of it that happens. But, you know, I have to confess to you, Dean, I didn't have this view of Eisenhower until I did all this research. Hmm. I grew up with the typical background that said I was a guy who, this grandfatherly guy, would just rather play golf than be an effective president. And God, was I wrong. <laughs> you know, I did not understand what happened and how he went about it. He could be devious, but he could also be strategic. You know, he would not even mention McCarthy's name in public. Yeah. I couldn't find one time that he <laughs> wow. did. Not one. Even when he saw him, it, that was pretty cool in the book. He'll see him and he'll just go, yeah, hey, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and people thought that was so strange. <laughs> and so when he did denounce McCarthy's tactics, he didn't attach it to the name. And, and for news people, that just drove them up the wall. And they couldn't figure out why. And, you know, privately, he wrote all kinds of letters to friends saying, hey, if I give him that kind of attention, it'll just enhance his prestige. He, uh, he was very critical. Harry Truman rhetorically denounced McCarthy, and McCarthy's prestige only grew during the Truman years. Yeah. And I think the other more subtle thing that Eisenhower believed was that if he came out against McCarthy directly, that it would make him the issue, not McCarthy, that it would let McCarthy off the hook. And it's a subtle psychological game he plays with McCarthy because McCarthy was an attention hound. He couldn't stand not being noticed. And, hmm. and Ike understood that it would just cause him to do something even more rash if he just didn't mention his name. The Nixon thing there, to just back up a second, I always think of the 
eulogy that President Bill Clinton gave at the time of Nixon's funeral out there in Yorba Linda, California. And he said that the time had come now with Nixon having passed away to judge him on the whole record. This book, definitely, Ike and McCarthy, you see, he, he plays a role here and he doesn't he doesn't think about himself. I mean, he's he's loyal and he does the right thing here. He really, I like to see a vice president and a president working together. Yeah, well, Eisenhower had great confidence in him. And, you know, he was a young man. He was 39 years old when he became vice president. And and uh, it was really uh, young, and Eisenhower had a lot of confidence in him. But, you know, one thing I should add to what I've said so far, Dean, another reason Eisenhower went after McCarthy the way he did was right after Charles Bullen won the appointment to be ambassador, Eisenhower said to his aides quietly, you know, privately, McCarthy has the bug to run for the presidency in 1956. And Ike declared and slapped his knee and thundered, the only reason I would consider running again would be to run against him. <laughs> I believe that McCarthy wanted to be president. And Dwight Eisenhower intended to run for a second term. He's all over the place denying that he ever really... Ike always wanted his ambition closed in a call to duty. But in the age of Roosevelt, if you're going to be a great president, you had to have a second term. He saw McCarthy as a political rival. And there are multiple reasons why I went after him, some of them idealistic, but some of them crassly political. You write in Ike and McCarthy, quote, Ike had not won the war in Europe by making speeches. And you alluded to that a little bit earlier about saying that the rhetoric is just not there. It's not soaring. It's sort of like Kansas, I guess, some of it, the sort of flat plains farmer, very honest speaking. He's not a guy who's going to go out there and really light it on fire. He did work in his speeches. It was, it's very interesting in this book, Ike and McCarthy, because you see – thanks to your digging, all the behind-the-scenes stuff that Eisenhower did that made it appear casual. It takes a lot of work to appear that way or to be unselfconscious. It's what, what great actors do. You compare his strategy to World War II's Operation Fortitude to deceive Hitler about the D-Day landings. And I wonder, despite my earlier ham-handed trying to wedge in a military reference to Nixon's role, what threads from Ike's time as Supreme Commander do you see carrying over into his war against McCarthyism? Well, certainly, Ike had a capacity for deception in his bones. Some reviewers have thought it's a stretch for me to compare it to the D-Day thing. The, the D-Day thing was huge, but politically, in the city of Washington, this was not small. Ike believed, as good military people did, that if you can deceive an enemy, you will tempt him into doing things he didn't plan to do. And then they'll make a big mistake, and then you can ambush him. And that's what they did with Joe McCarthy. I'm not truly qualified to speak in detail about his World War II operations, but I did find carrying over to his presidency was his extraordinary ability to select, deploy, and manage people. Indeed, he kept some of his key aides from the war years with him. Uh, Walter Beadle Smith ended up being Deputy Undersecretary of State, Jerry Persons became the White House congressional liaison. Those were both men who were with him in the war. In the McCarthy story, Eisenhower has six key aides that carry out his policy with complete confidentiality. And Ike the general and Ike the president was a master at delegation. He would brief a subordinate up front on a task, monitor what they did, and debrief him at the end of the task. And if that effort went south, they all understood that they, not the boss, would take the heat. And Herbert Brownell, the attorney general, wrote about how at such times Ike might leave them out on the proverbial limb. <laughs> and he did. He did guard his own popularity. Sometimes that was a little tough on the aides. But boy, these half dozen people particularly, there were others who were very loyal to him too in different fields, like John Foster Dulles in the, the State Department. But Dulles wasn't deeply involved with the operation against McCarthy. So these people took kind of a blood oath to protect the confidentiality. And some of them, I desire that this not be traced to him. Some of them stuck with it even after he died. The recruitment of Frederick Seaton is a great example of this deployment of people that carried over to his presidency. I've already told you, I think, about Seaton's background. He was a Kansan and all. G. David Shine, Roy Cohn's boyfriend. Let's be sure your listeners have the, the, the background on that. Roy Cohn was the uh, chief counsel for McCarthy's subcommittee. And Cohn 
talked McCarthy into bringing G. David Shine, this handsome New Yorker, aboard as an unpaid consultant. Well, David Shine got his Army draft notice in July of 1953. And right after that, I can't connect them, but boy, I think the dots could be connected. Dwight Eisenhower called Fred Seaton out in Nebraska, where he was at the time publishing the Hastings newspaper. And he asked Fred Seaton to come back and take a newly designed assistant secretary of defense position in the Pentagon. His job would be congressional relations, Joe McCarthy in particular. And when he was trying to persuade Engine Charlie Wilson, the secretary of defense, about having Seaton aboard, he told Wilson, this is really military language, he said to Wilson that Seaton, he always considered Seaton, quote, a reserve division right. ready to go into action. Uh, there's one man with a reserve division, and Fred Seaton certainly was. If there's a hero of this piece, besides Eisenhower, it is Fred Seaton. And that military thing says something about how he carried over from the war to how to handle people. And I would just say briefly that people may say, well, it's not of the complexity or pressure of D-Day, but we can't know what history would have been like if uh, we'd ended up with a President Joe McCarthy. Over the course of your book, you talk about McCarthy's popularity in the early years of Eisenhower's presidency. So he really does have some high stakes. And if he hadn't been successful in this effort, as he was on D-Day, we might be looking back and saying, if only Eisenhower had done something, if only he had succeeded. Somebody could have stopped Hitler early soon. Maybe we would have said, oh, that poor little mustached guy that somebody went and shot. He was doing such great things for Germany. So we have to put ourselves, I think, in the shoes, and that's what Ike and McCarthy does, put us in that era and realize that Eisenhower has serious concerns here, and there's real reasons for it. This is not just a drunken buffoon that maybe we think of McCarthy today. He had a base of support. Well, in January 1954, Joe McCarthy was arguably the most popular politician in the country, with the exception of Eisenhower. He had a, a rating in the Gallup poll in January of 54 of 50% 50 positive, 29% negative. And he was still on the rise at that point. Very influential. The most single most influential senator. And in terms of, of running for office, Henry Cabot Lodge, Eisenhower's ambassador to the United Nations and a close advisor, was convinced that McCarthy wanted to run for president. I'm not sure that Joe really thought that far ahead about things. He kind of uh, led with his gut on many things. But Eisenhower certainly believed it and is on record several times saying that. And he's on record comparing him to Hitler. Yeah, that's something. That's a, a particular episode in, on May 28th of 1954 where he talks with Jim Haggerty about how McCarthy acted like Hitler. Richard Hofstadter, a great historian, wrote a book about the paranoid style in American politics. And Hofstadter argued that roughly once every generation, a paranoia boils up in the American populace. We get scared. We get scared periodically. And it's just about every generation. There was a red scare after World War I. There's this red scare in the 50s. And some people would argue that in terms of terrorism, we've had one very recently now that when we get paranoid, uh, demagogues can take advantage of it. And that's what Joe McCarthy was doing. And he was riding high in January of 1954. And don't forget, everybody, Ike had a ticker that sometimes went out on him. He had a heart attack. So not so impossible to think the, of a scenario there if you were an alternative history or alternate history, rather, author of ways that it could have gone south and we could have ended up with a President McCarthy. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a scary thought. <laughs> yes. We can be too. Uh, Joe McCarthy, the human being, was a charming, industrious, talented man in a lot of ways. One of his great problems was he, he was a drunk. That's, that's not the good word. He was an alcoholic who didn't get the treatment he needed to have. We're speaking with David A. Nichols, author of Ike and McCarthy, Dwight Eisenhower's Secret Campaign Against Joseph McCarthy. You'll find him on Twitter at David A. Nichols and the digit 8. Kirkus Review wrote of the book, quote, Nichols has studied Eisenhower diligently and fully understands his subtle methods, especially his ability to never lower himself to McCarthy's level, unquote. The Army McCarthy hearings set the stage for exposing what's really going on, how McCarthy is misusing his office, misusing his power to subpoena, having these one-man committee hearings. 
They go after Roy Cohn and his attempt to influence the posting of this private G. David Shine. What new insights did you uncover that can illuminate Eisenhower's role in bringing that damaging revelation into play against McCarthy? Well, I mentioned that January of 1954 was the high point of McCarthy's popularity, and that's precisely when the plan was hatched to go after McCarthy. On January 21st, there was a meeting in the Attorney General's office of Eisenhower's key advisors. I knew about that meeting ahead of time, got briefed about it afterwards. One of the things you have to watch out for is just because Eisenhower is not in a meeting himself doesn't mean he's not pulling the strings in it. And they had this meeting, and among other things in that meeting, John Adams, the Army Council, told them in detail about all the privileges that Roy Cohn had attempted to get for G. David Shine. After Shine had received his draft notice, Cohn had harassed the Army again and again to get a special commission to Shine so he would stay with the McCarthy Committee and therefore with him. And when he struck out on that, He harassed them and other kinds of things. He still managed to pressure the Secretary of the Army into letting Shine off nights and weekends so they could go and do what they called euphemistically committee business in a nearby hotel, not in the office that was provided for Shine. And so this went on continually, continually. And eventually, Cohn got so angry with the Army that I'm convinced he talked Joe McCarthy into launching hearings in the communists in the army. And you got to think about that. That's with a five-star general in the White House. But anyway, out of that meeting, Sherman Adams, Ike's chief of staff, told John Adams, not related, the army council, to put together a report. And he sent the White House a stack of documents on all this that had been going on, quite a stack, 40-some different documents. Pretty soon they sent that back to Fred Seaton with orders to edit it into a publishable report, which Seton went to work on. Now, this was all secret, and never was this traced to the White House, even though uh, Seton was really Ike's man in the Pentagon. And so they moved forward during January and February. One of the main events that really triggered things was on February 18th, 1954, McCarthy was holding all these months hearings on communists and the Army, and he calls in General Ralph Zwicker. And Zwicker, the base he was at, was the boss of Irving Perez, a dentist who had refused to um, waive his constitutional rights and say whether he'd ever been a communist when he took the oath. He had been drafted into the Army because of a shortage of dentists and doctors during the Korean War. And so Perez is typical... Joe McCarthy always went after the little people. He never went after big people. He went after little people. So he went after this dentist. And then he calls in Ralph Zwicker, his supervising general. And Zwicker was a hero of the war in Europe. And they have this transcript. It's largely excerpted in my book of this savage performance that McCarthy does on this great and heroic general and ends up finally saying to him, administering the ultimate insult, saying to Zwicker, you, sir, are not fit to wear the uniform of the United States Army. That really infuriated Eisenhower, and that pushed this secret plan along. And the plan was helped along in March by a couple of important events. First, Senator Ralph Flanders, Republican senator of Vermont, did a big speech attacking McCarthy on the Senate floor. And then the same day as that attack, Edward R. Murrell, did a famous broadcast attacking McCarthy, a broadcast that uh, has wonderful words in it. That was March 9th, 1954. The timing was right, and two days later, on March 11th, Fred Seaton released that published report, and it caused a firestorm of controversy, and eventually so much controversy that the McCarthy Committee decided to have televised hearings, and McCarthy stepped aside as chair And as I said before, those hearings went on for two solid months. And the American people saw Joe McCarthy for what he was, for the obnoxious bully he was, on television for two solid months. And by the time those hearings ended in June of 1954, McCarthy was upside down in the polls. He never recovered. I always chuckle with affectionate Eisenhower's early speeches when you can watch a video of them. 
yet he embraces the technology here in Ike and McCarthy and does have those hearings televised. McCarthy knows enough to not want them televised. He wants to keep them behind closed doors, and they lead to his downfall. They really expose him, and as you said, is the bully he's been. In fact, I'd written little people in all caps here in the margin of my script because you talk about one lady, an African-American lady, and you really feel for her. She's just treated so harshly, and she... You know, Doris Walters Powell. Yeah. Very confused, yeah. and very very just shaken by it. And here you're before a Senate hearing, and TV is very early here. So what role does it play in the Eisenhower presidency and in McCarthy's downfall? Well, the age of TV is just coming about. I don't pretend to be an expert on that, but I know Eisenhower's first filmed press conference, they didn't televise it live initially, was on January 19th, as I recall, 1955. Ike didn't do a lot of live television during that time. Although he did do some. January 4th, 1954, he stole a page from Franklin Roosevelt's playbook with a fireside chat. He didn't call it that, with the American people on radio and television, and reviewed in simple language the themes in his upcoming State of the Union message. So he did that kind of thing. Eisenhower, I think, did more talking than he gets credit for. He was not a great speech maker, but he did at least three truly great speeches. His Chance for Peace speech on April 16th, 1953 is one of the great speeches ever done by a modern American president. He took a big chance. McCarthy could have accused him of being soft on the communists because he was talking to the new leadership of the Soviet Union, offering an olive branch of peace. We can play a little bit of that. Why don't we play a little bit of that? Address of the President, the American Society of Newspaper Editors. Statler Hotel, Washington, D.C., 16 April, 1953. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete pavement. We pay for a single fighter plane with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is, I repeat, the best way of life to be found on the road the world has been taking. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. And I submit to you that's about as eloquent as any modern president has been. But I, you know, if you listen to him on TV, and you may have, uh, he didn't have the cadence. He was not a comfortable speechmaker in many regards. Yeah, he's not the camera they say loves some people. And And he was very sick, very sick that night, by the way. Really, quite sick. Hey, like Lincoln before the Gettysburg Address. Yeah, he was. He he had been uh, probably had a, a flare up with this ileitis that eventually had surgery from. We we don't know for sure, but he was quite ill. That makes me think of the imagery from William Jennings Bryan, the Cross of Gold speech, yes. the Cross of Iron. There yes. again, he's reaching back to that World War II experience, and he's talking about it and invoking it. And he worked on these speeches. You have that in Ike and McCarthy. You know, he's working on his speeches, and you quote in there Churchill, someone asking him, "What do you do in your free time?" Oh yeah. I practice my spontaneous speeches yeah. and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. well, Ike was, well, he used speech makers. He did. He had some good ones, speech writers. But he always went over him himself. And, you know, the detail of what went into that April 16th, 1953 speech is phenomenal. It went through, gee, at least a dozen drafts. He also experimented with television. There's one where um, he did remarks where he just sat on the uh, corner of the desk in the Oval Office and did what appeared to be off the cuff. It wasn't off the cuff. He had the remarks memorized. 
one journalist said later, it was he had achieved what everybody wants to have on television, which is naturalness. Mm -hmm. So he'd experimented some, but it was still the early days. Nobody would argue that Ike was really a pro at TV. He was certainly not as skillful at it as John F. Kennedy turned out to be. You dedicate Ike and McCarthy to two men, one who coined the term hidden hand for Ike's strategy that we've been speaking about here to take on this senator. They waited such a long time to see their insights included in the historical record of the McCarthy period. I wonder what your working relationship was like with them. How did they help you to push you along when you had these times when Ike, I think, kept closing the door on you kind of and wouldn't let you see what was going on? Well, I love those two men. Fred Greenstein's still living. Uh, Bill Ewald is not. He died just a couple of years ago. Fred Greenstein you know, wrote his book in 1982, The Hidden Man Presidency, and forever gave us that bumper sticker to use on Ike's leadership. People use it all the time without knowing what it means much. It's yeah. like McCarthyism, but he's the hidden hand. Fred is a political scientist, and so he did McCarthy as a case study, and he didn't get all the details. He didn't have the Fred Seaton papers I talked about to go through, but he still had some remarkable insights initially. And then Bill Ewald did this book with a whodunit title in 1984, published Who Killed Joe McCarthy? And William Ewald was a really interesting man. He was an aide, a speechwriter in the Eisenhower White House, a Ph.D. from Harvard in English, and also helped Ike write his memoirs. Really a sharp guy, and I talked with Bill a number of times. But the interesting thing about William Ewald is he ends up a little uncertain at the end about Eisenhower's direct role. He wasn't sure that Ike had a blueprint or a plan for what he was doing with McCarthy. I'm much more certain of that, and I have an explanation for that. I just think that Ewald ultimately thought about Ike like an aide does, and one of his main confidants for interviews after Eisenhower's death was Sherman Adams, Ike's chief of staff. I once asked Bill, did you always believe everything that Sherman Adams told you? And he said, oh, yes. And I said, well, I'm not sure you should have. I didn't say that to him, actually. <laughs> but anyway, back to those great, wonderful guys. I'm babbling about that a little bit. I'm sorry. Is that Fred Greenstein... I had some difficulty persuading anybody to publish this book initially because so much ink had been spilled on McCarthy. And Fred called me up and he said, Dave, I think it's important you do this book. I think you ought to hunt around if you go to university press, whatever, get it done. And that coming from the great Fred Greenstein, that meant a lot to me. As it turned out, I was able to persuade Simon & Schuster to go ahead and publish it. I'm glad they did because I really enjoyed it. It was great to dig into. And as I said, I like Eisenhower. It's nice to see him coming up. Hey, I like Ike. That's a good slogan. Maybe he should have used that. But <laughs> but I, I like Eisenhower. I like to see him getting his due here. And I like to see somebody who's maybe not the flashiest. It's pretty cool. It's like seeing the car that's maybe not the fastest winning the Daytona 500. It's, yeah, or right. the flashiest painter or the most sponsors. It's almost an underdog story. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But Ike's not really an underdog. He uh, No, he's not. He was pretty smart. You know, he, he still had a 58% approval rating in the Gallup poll when he left office. Yeah. He, he wasn't dumb politically. He made mistakes in the first year or so, but boy, he learned quickly. With presidential historians, as we talked about, you know, people would rather study a Kennedy or one of the Roosevelt's or somebody flashy. And I, I guess in my mind, that's the thing. They look at the timeline of United States presidents and they say, oh, OK, Eisenhower, nothing really happened. Well, Ike and McCarthy shows how much important and dramatic is happening behind the scenes. That's why I'm really glad that you stuck with it and that Simon & Schuster published it. Well, we mentioned Kennedy a couple of times. One of the things I didn't say about the neglect of the Eisenhower heritage is how glamorous Kennedy was. And his assassination made him into an icon. And I must confess to you, I was hooked. My number two son is named John Kennedy Nichols. Hmm. You know, I, at that time, I was enthralled, and not with Eisenhower, with Kennedy. That's when I was a young graduate student. I've had to revise my whole outlook on both those guys. I really have. I never talk too much to my son about it. <laughs> He's proud of the name. <laughs> it's sort of like being the opening act for the Rolling Stones, I say, with some of these presidents. Yes, Theater right. was about the same thing. I mean, I love William McKinley. I have tremendous respect for him. I know a ton about him. I've also been to his museum. He's similar to Eisenhower in this quiet, doing things behind the scenes, delegating, very popular at the time. Also, Simon & Schuster has a great biography coming out now about 
McKinley, I was going to call him the major because that was his nickname. And sometimes I refer to him as that, uh-huh. but Robert W. Mary has a new book coming out and I'll be talking to him oh, about okay. McKinley. And I guess that's what I mean when I think of the underdogs, these people that may not be known too well. And I'm really glad that this book will explain that because for one thing about books, you know, they're literally burning books here, literally McCarthy's with the people who want to tear books out of overseas libraries, right? And Eisenhower says, forget it. We can't use the tools of dictatorship to fight for freedom. You You've got to just let people read them, and we have to learn what's going on there and find out about communism. We're going to fight it. That's that's very bold of him, and I don't think anybody would know that if they didn't pick up a book like Ike and McCarthy that gives them a fair shake. You know, Eisenhower makes that case in June of 53 at Dartmouth College where he bluntly says, don't join the book burners. It's a great and important speech. It's supposedly an off-the-cuff speech, but it's another one, like you mentioned before, very well rehearsed. It wasn't really off the cuff. He just wrote it himself and didn't have a speechwriter involved. But don't join the book burners. Don't think you're going to conceal faults by concealing evidence that they ever existed. Don't be afraid to go in your library and read every book. But again, he did that speech without mentioning Joe McCarthy's name. <laughs> Never mentioned him. I, I love those moments, especially when you think of that trademark big eyes and how a smile that he would see him and McCarthy's trying to kind of get close to him and get a little bit of his aura and Eisenhower just sees him across the room and doesn't want to give him that handshake, doesn't want to be up on stage with him. And yet he doesn't want to give him, oh, the president snubbed me. He has to make it look very casual. Well, in an article Ike wrote for the Reader's Digest before his death, in which he does finally talk publicly, about uh, McCarthy. Uh, I end the book with that. And one of the former critics of his approach to McCarthy came to him later and said, gosh, Mr. President, you were right about McCarthy. And Ike smiled broadly and said, sometimes I am. (laughs) He knew what he'd done. My time is about up, as they say in committee hearings, and that's a good note to end it on. One final question, though, as not somebody that's a political science or an office holder, we frequently hear the McCarthyism charge thrown around, sort of like what you were saying about throwing out the charge of somebody being homosexual or somebody being a communist. It shuts down debate very quickly, and people are afraid, so they skew really far away. And I wonder what you learned from all this research for Ike and McCarthy to teach us about trying to find Eisenhower's way here in the middle. We have real threats that we face. We don't want to go too far and have an overreaction like McCarthyism was, which was a symptom. It's not limited to one man. As Eisenhower said, he's a symptom what he was doing. And yet we don't want to just ignore threats and say, well, there's no threats from the Soviets. There's no threat from terrorism or anarchists, which would have been a generation before the Great War, another big period of fear and power. Paranoia. So how do we do that? What did you learn from this book? What do you hope readers will learn from it about taking a step back and not joining the paranoia? Well, it's a, a great question because we hear McCarthyism. And indeed, Donald Trump used it recently to describe the Obama administration. So it's part of our political lexicon that we use the term without knowing what it is. And Eisenhower, however, espoused what he called the middle way. And I know that sounds kind of lame in our superheated rhetorical climate now. And there's that old maxim that says that the person who walks in the middle of the road may get hit by a big truck. But nevertheless, moderation, middle of the road, I called one of the memoirs, one of his memoirs is called The Middle Way. That spirit of don't join the book burner speech needs to be translated into new terms for a new age. I would say don't join the panickers. Don't act on fear. The exploitation of fear is one of the most dangerous things in a period like we have now. Don't label people as the enemy just because they're different or immigrants or of another race. Don't swallow fake news. They didn't use that term in the 50s, but Joe McCarthy spouted fake news all the time. Joe really peddled it. His announcement that he had the names of 205 communists in the State Department was a lie. So, you know, I think we ought not hesitate to call liars liars, although I admit that Dwight Eisenhower probably would never have done that in public. You know, (laughs) seek the truth diligently, learn and get good facts. I still love that quote attributed to Pat Moynihan, who said that everybody has a right to their own opinions, but not to their own facts. Moderation, you know, is not cowardice. It's really the only way a democracy can work. We're going to find that kind of wisdom if people pick up Ike and McCarthy and 
we all think that we would have been on the side against the book burners, but we never know. I think you have to examine everything. This book certainly helps you to do that because you're seeing the inner workings of a great tactician here taking on a demagogue and finishing him and not leaving any fingerprints. That's what great hitmen do in the mob, right? Although I wouldn't want to compare Eisenhower to him, but you, know, <laughs> you get the idea. So thank you so much for joining me today and giving the general his due at last. Eisenhower may not have fought in the flashy style of today's Hollywood presidents. You weren't going to see him jumping out of a plane or punching a bad guy in the face, but he fought nonetheless. He fought to win. He fought the good fight, and our world is certainly better for it. Best of luck with the book, and thank you again for your time. Thank you, Dean. Ike for president. Ike for president. Ike for president. You like Ike. Again, the book is Ike and McCarthy, Dwight Eisenhower's secret campaign against Joseph McCarthy. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there. Or even navigate using the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, we take you to Amazon, and amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just a few extra clicks, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. Thanks to David A. Nichols for joining us and for setting the record straight on Eisenhower's strategy to end McCarthy's witch hunt for communists while still protecting America from the very real Soviet threat. Our guest is relatively new to Twitter, so I'm sure he'll appreciate you shooting him a follow at David A. Nichols and the Digit 8. And while you're at it, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're listening to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today. And have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.